All right, I'm just gonna go. Ready, three, two, one, go. Okay. And oh. Uh, oh wait, hold on. Let me get to the right thing first. Okay. okay. Now I'm ready. And we're live. So yeah, go ahead. Uh, just give me a countdown, whatever. Oro, your audio is echoing. I think. I know. If it is, it's you guys, just because you're loud. Are you? Are you, are you ready? Yeah. yeah three, two, one, whatever. All right. Three, two, one, go. Oh, God. All right. So, hey, guys. This is Hollow Knight. Um, so, for the any percent glitchless category, I'll get to that first. Um, there are two different glitch categories, actually, for this game. There's storage out of bounds and no storage out of bounds. Uh, one of the main ways of breaking this game is with a technique called map storage. And map storage basically lets you just do whatever the heck you want to this game. Um, and you can use it to get out of bounds, as the category name suggests. Um, unfortunately for a lot of people, doing the storage out of bounds require uh, making your computer run worse in order to hit specific frame windows. So a lot of people don't really want to mess with that. Um, so they run uh, no storage out of bounds on older patches instead, which uses different glitches. Um, but I won't be doing any of those because this is glitchless. Um, so basically to describe this game, uh, the best way I usually describe it to people is Ori in the Blind Forest meets Dark Souls. It's kind of the artistry of Ori with kind of Dark Souls-esque storytelling. Um, so we're basically this unnamed bug wanderer who's wandering into this, um, kind of ruined city called Hollow Nest. And we're going to be kind of discovering what happened, um, to put it that way. Uh, much like, you know, Dark Souls, you kind of wind up in Lordran and find out that everything's in the middle of chaos and all that stuff. So, you'll notice uh, right there I just opened my menu while I was falling. Um, what that does in this game is it just makes you fall faster and it cancels out landing lag. Um, there's been a lot of debate over whether that's a glitch or not, but we've opted to allow it just because of various reasons. Um, and it, it saves frames over the course of the run. It's not a huge deal at all. Um, so I guess I'll explain the UI a little bit as well. Um, so up in the top left, I have that big circle that has a little bit of, like, white water-looking stuff in it. Um, what that is, is my soul. Uh, so I generate soul by hitting enemies. And what I can use that for is either healing myself or casting spells, which I don't have any of yet, but I will be getting very, very soon here. Um, so there's a very high risk-reward system with this game between healing yourself and using spells. The spells are very highly damaging, so it's very worth it to use them. And obviously, in a speedrun setting... We're going to be trying to use spells as much as possible and avoid healing as much as possible. Um, next to that are those five little mask things. Um, those are my health. Um, each is, you know, one unit. They don't subdivide like in Zelda or anything else. Um, below that is my Geo Counter. That's basically my currency or experience. Um, I get it from defeating enemies. I have to manually pick it up. Um, which is kind of annoying, but there's a charm that you can get that lets it automatically pick up if you're playing the game casually, which is really, really nice. Um, so yeah, that's basically the basic gist of things. Uh, so right now I'm heading to the first boss. Uh, the progression at the beginning of the game is pretty straightforward. Uh, this is a Metroidvania, so there is a lot of freedom that you're given. And this game actually gives you pretty large amounts of freedom uh, really, really early. Um, one of the big things that people complain about with this game is that it doesn't give you enough direction. And it's really easy to just not know where to go because you get so much of the map super early. Um, and that definitely was the case for me in my first casual playthrough. There was one upgrade that you're meant to get pretty early that I just completely avoided and explored most of the map without it. Um, and that's one of the things that's most beautiful about this game to me is that you just have so many options and you can get away with so much without really accomplishing a whole lot. Um, uh, so we're coming up on our first boss here. This is False Knight. Uh, he's basically a little wimpy grub in a big suit of armor that he stole from, um... Basically a legendary knight that uh, fell when the kingdom fell into chaos. So we basically have to hit him a certain number of times to break his armor, or uh, to stagger him. And then he pops out and we can hit him. Um, and actually that seemed a little hard, so let's just get out of here. So that actually is an intended part of that fight. Uh, after his first phase, you can just break out of that wall that starts crumbling. Um, and that entirely skips the fight. Uh, you do actually have to kill him later if you're playing through all of the content. Um, but he just stays there and kind of just chills if you leave the room early. 
Uh, there are two rewards you get from beating him. Uh, 200 Geo, uh, so 200 currency, and um, an item called a City Crest, which gets you into one of the areas from one of two directions that you have to enter it. We're going to be taking the other entrance to that area, so we're saving a little bit of time by not having to kill that guy. Because uh, he has like three more phases after that that are basically identical to that one and take quite a while. So now we have our first spell, which is Vengeful Spirit. Um, it's basically just a little fireball that passes through things and uh, deals a bunch of damage. So to kind of explain damage a little bit, um, we have our nail that I've been swinging around for damage up until this point. Uh, you can upgrade that uh, a few times, and we're only been doing it once in this run, but the base damage on it right now is 5. So that's going to be our kind of base reference point for damage. Um, the spell that I just got does 15. So already the weakest spell in the game is disgustingly efficient as far as damage. Um, there are upgrades for each of the spells. Uh, there's one upgrade for each of the three spells in the game. We're only going to be getting this one spell and no upgrades for it. So these guys are pretty annoying. They're completely, they, they block off any uh, hits that you would do if you get too close to them. They're basically here to train you to use your new projectile. Um, but whether they spit out enemies to let you generate soul to use for those spells is completely random. So they can sit there and just like shoot fireballs if they want to and it wastes about a second and a half every single time they do. Uh, I often refer them uh, or compare them to Idors and Metroid Fusion because it's basically the same principle. Um, so I just rested on a bunch. These are basically the bonfires of Dark Souls. Uh, when you die, you go back to one, you leave all the stuff that you had behind, and you have to go reclaim it. Um, what I just equipped in the menu there uh, is one of many charms that you get in these games, or this game. And uh, what these charms do is you have little notches that you uh, have slots to equip charms, and each charm has a different cost. Um, and the charm that I just equipped will make me generate more soul from hitting enemies. So instead of taking 9 hits to hit uh, max soul to fill out the meter, it takes 8. Um, not a huge deal, but it doesn't take very long to equip, and it saves a little marginal amount of time every single time I would we uh, reach a full meter. So we have one more of these guys here. Thankfully, this is the last of them. Um, but now we have to get into the next area of the game called Green Path, which is where we're going to find our first movement upgrade. As this is a Metroidvania, a lot of the upgrades we're going to be getting that allow us to progress farther are movement upgrades. So there's a rather new, uh, it's, I wouldn't really call it an entirely new trick. It's more of a replacement for a trick that we used to do. Um, that's basically the reason I'm gathering soul right now is for this uh, new version of the trick, essentially. We used to use a mosquito that was actually deliberately put there by the developers to see if people could figure out to do the skip. Um, but we found a skip for the skip, so we're going to completely avoid dealing with the mosquito. Hopefully, if I don't mess up here. Yeah, so if you have full soul there, you can just jump all the way from the edge of the uh, platform there and turn around and quickly fire three spells. And the backwards momentum from the spells gives you enough push to get back up onto that ledge. It's pretty neat. Saves a little bit of time and reliability over using the mosquito. So I'm going to be generating a little bit more soul here. There's a mini boss that we need to fight that I need another full meter for. Something you might have noticed by now as well is that every single time I hit something with my nail, uh, it gives me a slight little knockback, and if you use that on top of an enemy, you can use that to sort of pogo off of them, which is really, really handy in a lot of instances, and you're going to see a lot of that. Um, in addition, if you ever see me slashing something on the ground vertically, um, that's to completely avoid the knockback, essentially. Um, since if I horizontally slash something, it would push me back left or right. Um, but if I slash up, it essentially pushes me down into the ground, and if I'm standing on the ground, there is no knockback, essentially. So it's really nice to just avoid getting pushed around unnecessarily. So I'm going to hit the enemies here, build up a little bit more soul for the next boss, which is coming up very shortly here. This is probably my favorite fight in the game, just because it's not really... It doesn't really have any potential to get stupid, and it's just over really fast, and it's really satisfying to just play really aggressively and destroy her quickly. And actually, the health I have here should be okay. Um, there's a glitch on this boss in older patches where if you stagger her out of a certain attack, 
it shifts her hitbox towards the front of her a little bit. Um, and it's really easy to just get hit while you're trying to hit her, but they fixed that, thankfully. Okay, that was kind of a slow fight. Um, a lot of those spells that I shot that stagger her, uh, if you get lucky, you can double hit her with the spells because she'll get knocked back into the spell as it continues to travel, but I didn't get a single one that I noticed on that fight, which is really unfortunate. Usually you hope for at least two, um, but that's not a huge deal. It only saves a couple seconds. So now we have the Mothwing Cloak, which allows us to dash. Um, and you'll notice that I just uh, quit out and reloaded the game. Uh, what that does is it warps me back to the last bench that I rested at, which is extremely helpful for getting around the map really quickly. If we had to backtrack everywhere, this run would be a lot longer. And we're going to make use of a lot of save warps throughout the run. So, the most interesting thing about this dash is that if you are on the ground and you dash off of a platform, um, it resets your essential stock of dashes. So, you can kind of use that to get around the... Um, the limit that you usually have where you can only dash once while in midair, uh, as well as decreasing the cooldown on the dash, because there is an inherent cooldown on when you can use it again. So you're going to notice here that I'm kind of deliberately landing on a bunch of these platforms. That's partially to avoid landing lag, because if you fall a large distance, um, you kind of just crash, and it pauses you there for, you know, about half a second to a second. Um, so I'm avoiding that, as well as resetting my dashes to make sure that I have a dash up whenever I want one. So this area is called Fungal Waste. As you might imagine, it's mushroom themed. Um, one of the big things about this area is these little mushrooms that are bouncy whenever you hit them. Um, so they let you get a lot of height when you pogo off of them, and they're really fun to use. So I'm picking up a little bit of Geo here. Um, most of the Geo that we need in this run is right ar along our path. But we do have to go out of our way for uh, some of it. Okay, good. That trick is fairly new. Um, and it saves a little bit of time in uh, the routing through this area. You have to go around a couple more rooms if you don't do that. Um, and unfortunately, you take two damage if you mess that up because you get hit by the projectile. So you have a limited amount of tries to that, but it is fairly consistent. There is a really good setup for it. So there is a way here um, to pogo off of these flying mantises in such a way that you can avoid having to walk back around after you hit the lever to open up the area to the mantis claw. Um, but I'm still relatively inconsistent at it, and it wastes a lot of time if you just sit there messing it up. Uh, it only saves about 10 to 15 seconds to get. So I don't really bother with it yet. Um, I will be doing this run at SGDQ, so hopefully I'll have it a little bit more consistent by then. But it used to be a little bit easier because we came from the right side and we had three mantises to pogo off of. But with the new route with that skip that I just did, uh, we only have two, which makes the trick a lot more difficult. Okay, so the mantis claw that I just got is essentially a wall jump. Uh, right now all we're getting is pretty basic movement abilities that you'd see in... Almost every other Metroidvania, I'd say. I'd say a lot of them have dashes, a lot of them have wall jumps. Um, so yeah, now we can wall jump. Um, the wall jump in this game isn't really anything special. It's exactly what it sounds like. Um, but one of the nice things about the wall jump in this game is that we can use it to reset dashes. Um, and as I mentioned before, that's a really important thing as far as going fast in this game. So we're doing a bit of backtracking here. And we're going to go fight what is technically supposed to be the first boss you run into um but it isn't a required fight uh to get to the upgrades that we have so far um but we do need it to get through to another upgrade that's uh we're actually going to get to from essentially backwards um so there's an area called crystal peak that you're intended to go through to get an upgrade called the dream nail um which is our next objective and 
To get into Crystal Peak, there are two requirements. One of them is getting a spell called Desolate Die, which we used to get in the run. Um, but we found this new trick that uh, lets us completely bypass that and save a bunch of time. Uh, the other option is to get an item called the uh, Lumafly Lantern, which costs 1800 Geo, which is kind of a lot. Uh, we don't have anywhere near that much uh, at this point. So we're going to have to find a backwards way to getting to here without having to farm Geo. So this is the first boss that you're intended to fight. That's really all it was. I kind of just hit it a couple times and it's dead. Um, the main gimmick of this fight is that when you kill it, it bursts and releases a bunch of enemies. So I'm going to try to use one spell to clean them all up, but that usually doesn't happen. Yeah. Usually they kind of just fly all around and you end up missing a couple. So I'm going to head over to the Sluber shop over here and buy one of the most important charms in this run, which is the Shaman Stone. So what the Shaman Stone does is increases the hitbox of any and all spells that you use, as well as increasing their damage by roughly 30%. So uh, that spell that I've been using so far will now do 20 damage instead of 15, as well as having a much larger hitbox, which is going to be very important as far as not only just hitting things, but getting double hits as well. Uh, and there are a couple fights where we're really going to want to hit things twice with a single fireball. Not only does a lot of damage, but it's just really efficient. So all this damage I'm taking right now is intentional. I actually need to die for this next trick. Um, so you'll see what happens when you die in this game. Uh, instead of a pool being left with your souls or anything like in Dark Souls, you get this little black blobby thing that represents you. And it has all your money, and being in this dead state also decreases the size of your soul gauge. So I can only hold two spells or heals instead of three. Um, you can kind of bait it and do a pogo off of it and get to that little ledge that you aren't supposed to be able to get to. Unfortunately, it results in us having to very slowly swim across here. Um, but it's a very necessary sacrifice because coming around this way is just extremely fast from a routing perspective. So we're going to head up now and trigger a little story sequence, which is going to give us the dream nail and kind of introduce why we're doing what we're doing. Um, so much like I'm going to compare it to Dark Souls again, much like in Dark Souls uh, with the Lord Souls, um, there are three dreamers in this game that are essentially um, keeping the world in stasis as it is and kind of perpetuating the way things are. Um, and we need to defeat all three of them in order to access the chamber where the final boss is sealed. Uh, so that's basically the primary goal of this game and all any percent really has to do. Uh, there's a lot of optional content in this game. Um, if you look at the amount of content that any percent does compared to, you know, completing the game, it's barely scratching the surface. There's just so much optional content in this game and almost all of it is worth exploring, I'd say. There's a couple bosses that, you know, aren't as great as the others, but... If these kind of games interest you at all, this is definitely the kind of game that I would recommend checking out. I've already gotten, I think, around 250 hours out of this game since it came out late February. So, I've definitely had a blast with it. Alright, so now we have the Dream Nail, which is... Um, serves twofold. It serve, The first purpose that it serves is to get us into... Um, the dream worlds of the dreamers, which allows us to actually kill them, uh, because they basically exist within their own dreams, but that's a weird lore thing that I won't get into. Um, and the second is we can use the dream nail on enemies to get a little bit of dialogue in their thoughts and get some lore from that. Obviously in a speedrun, that's not useful. Um, but the main use for it in a speedrun is to um, generate soul. Hitting something with the Dream Nail doesn't do damage, but it generates a bunch of soul compared to just hitting something, as well as being able to generate soul when something is otherwise undamageable. So there's a lot of bosses that have kind of invincibility periods, but you can still hit them during those periods in order to generate soul, which is extremely useful for one boss in particular that we'll get to in a decent bit here.
So now we're in City of Tears. This is the area that I mentioned before that we need the City Crest to get into usually. But since we came in here backwards, uh, we don't need that at all, which allows us to skip False Knight. Uh, so I'm going to pick up another one of uh, an item I picked up earlier and I didn't mention. This is a Wanderer's Journal. So there's three different kinds of items in this game um, that serve no other purpose but to sell. Uh, and the money route in this game is really, really tight. Uh, so we're going to be picking up those two items and there's... Another one I'm going to be picking up here in a sec, plus one more that I'll be selling. And that's going to give us basically all the rest of the money that we need that isn't just in our path. So that seal's relatively finicky to get to. You have to do a really precise wall jump into relatively precise pogos. And then just not bonk on the spikes. It took me quite a bit to get that consistent. It's actually a lot easier than you'd think. That's actually the casual way to uh, to do it, or the intended way, rather. So I mentioned money was tight. This is another enemy that we're going to be fighting purely for money. Ooh, that was weird. That's fine. I don't know why that didn't double hit. That was weird. So basically the strat for that fight, that kind of went weird, but uh, the strat for that fight is to hit it once, hit it up when it goes above you, and that makes it jump higher. Um, and then you can hit it again, which generates enough soul for a spell, and then you can use the spell to double hit it, and then you just repeat back and forth across the arena. Um, it's really easy for that rhythm to get messed up, and it kind of just throws everything off. So what I just did there is what we call early spire. Um, you're intended to have the double jump upgrade for that, but you can kind of just pogo off of the environment um, and get up here early, and that's the only time we really need double jump, so we're going to be able to entirely skip double jump by doing that. Don't do it. I hate this guy. Okay. Okay, so it's very important that I don't hit the ground there while I'm killing the flying enemy. Uh, because if I touch the ground, it activates the AI of that enemy that I just pogoed on 22 times. Um, and we don't have enough nail damage to really kill it quickly, so it requires a lot of pogos to uh, get enough damage on him. And if I touch the ground at all, he starts blocking all my attacks with his shield, and it takes basically twice as long to kill him. And we're trying to go fast, so we're not going to do that. So basically what I'm doing now is heading around to where the um, guy that we sell the items to for money, uh, as well as where the nail smith is that upgrades our nail. We're going to be getting one nail upgrade in this run because it takes our nail damage from 5 to 9. And if any of you guys can do basic math, that almost doubles our uh, nail damage, which is pretty heckin' good. Alright, I'm actually going to heal here just because this section is a little dicey and I don't want to be at 1 health. So, the last seal that I'm- oh my gosh. The last seal that I'm going to grab here is on some rafters. And these enemies here are really annoying and just like to get in your way all the time. And especially when I'm at low health like this, I'd rather get them out of my way. It is slightly faster to get hit by that guy if he cooperates because it hits you out of the picking the item up animation. Uh, which saves a, a minuscule amount of time, but it's still very nice. But that also requires him to be aggressive enough to hit you. Alright, so this is Lem. This is the only time we're going to see him, but we're going to sell all four of those items that I picked up. Uh, and that's going to give us a bunch of Geo. So basically the whole reason we used to get Desolate Dive to get into Crystal Peak was one, because we didn't have that, um, that uh, getting into the lake early that we have now. Um, but we basically had the option of farm a bunch of Geo, which takes forever. Or take like four minutes to go fight this boss for uh, the dive. So the dive was the pretty apparent option. Uh, but being able to cut that out was really nice. That was also one of the more annoying areas in the game that we had to go through to fight him. Um, there's just a lot of enemies that randomly teleport around. And just a lot of new runners got 
really walled there and did not have fun trying to get through there without getting hit. So we're heading to the Nailsmith now. Gonna upgrade our nail once, and then just save warp back to that bench that I rested uh, at the spire. And we're gonna fight the first boss that's guarding the first dreamer. This is probably one of the more annoying fights in the game. Although I generally say every major boss from this point on is pretty heckin' annoying. So this next boss I'm going to fight is the Watcher Knights, and it's basically a gauntlet fight. Um, there's six identical enemies that you have to fight. Uh, you can break a chandelier to make it only five, thankfully. Um, but their movements are extremely uh, sporadic and versatile, and there's almost no surefire way to kind of preempt what they're going to do. This fight is very reactionary, and I'm probably just going to shut up and focus on this fight. Because it is extremely scary. So there's the chandelier broken. That removes one of the beetles from the fight. Maybe I'll shut up here and let this fight speak for itself. Okay, that's a good start. <sighs> oh my gosh. I'm going to heal a couple times. Just be safe here. Oh my gosh. Holy crap. Okay. Okay, that fight was really sketchy. <laughs> but I think that pretty well illustrates how sporadic those guys can be. There's a lot of fake outs they can do where they just pull out from under you. Uh, they can also just start pogoing or bouncing at like a moment's notice and you just have to be ready to dash out of the way. You have to be on top of your game at all points during that fight. So I sent the elevator back down there, it's just ever so slightly slower to wall jump up here yourself. So this is the first dreamer. Each dreamer is resting on one of these pedestals, and you have to use the dream nail to enter their dream. And uh, take them out from within. They don't really put up uh, much of a fight though. So that's the first dreamer down. So basically whenever you take out one of the dreamers, it cuts to uh, the barrier blocking the uh, black egg where the final boss is sealed, and you're basically just seeing your progress. Alright, so unfortunately, every single time you defeat a dreamer, uh, the game sets a hard checkpoint at that point, so I can't save warp out of here, so I'm going to have to backtrack out of here manually, unfortunately. I cannot tell you how many questions I've gotten from people saying, why don't you save warp after you beat Lurian? And it's like, I don't know. You try it and see what happens and you tell me. 
And it was weird too, because people always like asked about this one. Like, they never asked about any of the other dreamers, like why I didn't I don't know. It was weird. And it kinda got on my nerves after a while. But yeah, we're gonna head back to one of the fast travel points that we haven't really seen of yet. Uh, you saw me unlock one, but I didn't really acknowledge it. Um, so there's a bunch of stations littered throughout the world um, where you can call a stag to for a fee. And uh, you can basically go to any station that you've unlocked with him. And we're going to be using him to fast travel back to the beginning of the game in order to buy the lantern now that we have enough money for it because we do still need it. Dang. That jump is really, really tight. And I rarely get it. So yeah, we're going to be going back and buying the Lantern, and then using it to head into Crystal Peak to get the Crystal Dash uh, upgrade. Which is more or less a Shine Spark from uh, Super Metroid and the like. Unfortunately, this one doesn't go vertically. It'd be really nice if you could go vertically with this one, but... Uh, the pausing when I fall increases my fall speed, and decreases... or completely removes landing lag. There's been a lot of debate over whether it's a glitch or not, but ultimately as a community we decided to allow it. Doesn't really save a whole lot of time, but it adds up. Uh, for the most part, it's only used on falls where you would trigger landing lag, um, but there are a couple shorter falls where I'll use it if it's a nice straight fall. The caveat is that you can't control your left or right movement while you're in the menu. So, you want to do it at times when you're just falling straight down. That's annoying. Okay. That's fine, I guess. I don't really like going into here with two health, but that's alright. I might take a safety heal here at some point. So, now that we've killed the first Dreamer, um, the main crossroads area is infected, and all the areas are, or all the enemies are infected as well. So all those little fly enemies that were relatively harmless before, those big, bloated, over-aggressive things that I just got destroyed by. And they're pretty dang annoying now. Ideally, you only take a hit there, um, just to do the fastest movement, but... If you don't do really precise movement, it kind of hex you up. So this area is largely cycle based, and if you have even the slightest error in your movement, you need to know where the cycles are going to be, or you're going to lose a lot of time and or die. So this is definitely an area you just get a feel for though after a while. Oops, I already missed that cycle. One slightly messed up jump completely throughout that cycle. Okay. And that's what happens if you don't correctly react to cycles. I was kind of afraid of that when the uh, flies destroyed me as much as they did. So now unfortunately we have to call this guy back. Uh, you might be asking yourself why I didn't rest at the bench at the Forgotten Crossroad Station. Um, I want to leave the bench at Dirtmouth at my, as my uh, checkpoint. Because I'm going to be save warping after I get the next movement upgrade here. Okay, I only got hit twice that time. Usually I'm okay with having three or more. Having two or less is really, really sketchy. Uh, there's one section where I want to do a damage boost as well uh, that I didn't get to quite yet. Um, so hopefully I still have the health to do that. Basically puts us on an earlier cycle if I do that, which is really beneficial. Saves about seven or eight seconds if I remember correctly. So I'm going to kind of have to mess up the cycle in the room that I died just to get my money back, unfortunately. That's definitely the hardest room in this area, though. B 
Because if you mess up even just slightly, it completely throws the whole thing out of whack. Where is my shade, actually? There you are. That's a really annoying spot. Okay, whatever. I'm gonna heal off of that guy really quick. Because like I said, I do want to have enough health to uh, damage boost. So doing some more fast falls here. Now this next room is going to be a bunch of lasers that are also on cycles. The devs definitely just took a cycle themed area and kind of went with it. Okay, so there's the damage boost. This puts us on one cycle earlier than you would be usually. If you have more health here, you can damage boost through more of these. Um, but I don't, so we're not going to. Alright, so now we have the Crystal Heart, which lets us do um, a really big dash, basically. Uh, and it's intended for large uh, horizontal expanses. I'm going to be seeing a little bit of it getting used in a sec here. So there is one item that we need to progress to the next area. Um, well, that we used to need, I should say. Um, there's an item called Ismus Tear, which allows us to swim in basically all of the acidic water in this game. And most of the water in this game is acidic. It's almost all of it. Um, but there's only one instance of the water that we actually need to get over. Or through, rather. Um, but if we do a very conveniently placed uh, super dash, we can just completely bypass getting it. And that saves multiple minutes. It skips an entire boss. We don't have to go into another area that we would have to go into otherwise. It's a lot of stuff that it skips. Oops. Just completely didn't dash there. Good stuff. And there we go. So if you line yourself up right on the corner of that platform, um, you can do a super dash off of the wall and just completely bypass that acid pit. One of the things that's really tricky about that is you actually have to cancel your uh, super dash manually before you hit the wall. Because this game is really finicky about you bonking into walls with the super dash and not giving you a wall jump afterwards. And your window to get a wall jump after the end of that is really, really tight. So you can't afford to shrink that window any more than what it already is. So this is the area where the next uh, Dreamer is. And this is another boss that I'm definitely going to have to shut up for. Um, this boss is cycle based. And every additional cycle that this boss takes is 20 to 25 seconds depending on the attacks that it does. Uh, and the cycle for the, the star for the two cycle is extremely precise. So let's see if I can get it here. Give me slow attacks, but that's okay. Definitely going to be a three or four cycle. I messed that up really bad. He also just gave me bad attacks for it, unfortunately. Oops, I could have gotten another hit there. Oh my gosh. This is really sketchy. Yeah, this is really bad.
I'm just gonna play this safe and ensure that I get the kill in this next cycle and not die. Okay, there we go. So like I said, ideally that fight ends in two cycles, but I messed that up pretty bad. Um, the main thing that lets you save time on that fight is getting Dream Nail hits on him when he's invincible. So basically that entire time that he's not all shriveled up, he's entirely invincible and hitting him... Nice wall jump. Uh, hitting him doesn't actually generate any soul. Uh, so you want to very precisely bait the boss so that you can space out Dream Nail hits because it takes quite a long time to charge up as well. Um, and the setup for that fight is relatively consistent. Um, but it's extremely, uh, extremely tight, and any error will most likely result in, uh, extra cycles. Um, also on the first cycle that I did, you ideally want your spells to knock him back, which is seemingly random, but it happens most of the time, so you kind of rely on it happening. Um, and him not getting knocked back completely messed up my spacing for the Dream Nail hits on the second phase, which just completely screwed that fight up. But that's okay. That's definitely one of those fights that if you make an error, you need to be ready for it. And try to make the most of it. Um, the attacks that he does actually slightly matter as well. Um, you want to stand in specific positions because when he's not doing an attack, he'll just follow you. Uh, so you want to bait him to specific spots. Uh, and his attacks take different amounts of time as well. So, based on, you know, when he ends the attack and when you have to, like, stop avoiding the attack differs with the two attacks that he can do. There's a weird thing here where your dash just like sometimes gets eaten right after the uh, dreamer section here. There's a couple ledges where that's the case in this game and I just I still don't understand why it happens. Sometimes it'll work, sometimes it won't. It's just completely random. I really should stop just expecting it to work and just kind of go with it, but... Um, and one of the reasons that I'm running on the patch that I'm on, uh, I never really mentioned this. I'm on the second to last patch that they've released. I'm on 1028. Uh, the current patch is 1031. Um, the only difference that's significant between those two patches is that boss had an unattended knockback effect on it when you hit it with at certain times. Um, and it took them up until now to fix it. Um... But they felt that fixing that made the fight too easy, so they gave the boss 20% more HP. Uh, you can still two-cycle the fight uh, with that extra HP, but it's even more tight than it already is. Uh, like, you have to just play it perfectly and get lucky, because you can get double hits on your spells on that fight as well. Um, so you kind of just need to get lucky and get double hits on them. Um, but it pretty reliably just adds a cycle to the fight, which, for obvious reasons, makes the speedrun quite a bit slower. So, headphone warning really quick. This wall is going to be a little loud. Okay. I guess that one's fine now that I don't hit it with a nail anymore. So, for whatever reason, I don't know if it was fixed in later patches and it just never worked for me. This game has a weird habit of operating differently for different people on the same patch. Um, but for almost everyone else, uh, the walls used to have a weird volume balance issue that supposedly got fixed, and it's just never fixed itself for me. I've uninstalled the game, reinstalled the game, done all this stuff, messed with the files, and it's just always stayed the same volume. But for whatever reason, I guess it's only when you hit the walls with your nail. Um, doing a, uh, backward spell hit there is a fairly new thing. I took a pretty big uh, break from this game up until like a couple weeks ago, so a lot of the stuff that is in the current route is still relatively new to me. And that's just one of many things. So we're gonna rest in this hot spring really quick to fill up my soul and my health really quick before we go into the next area. So this is uh, Deep Nest. This is one of the most annoying areas in this game and definitely my least favorite. Um, the main kind of gimmick to this uh, area is that it's a huge maze, uh, and that it's dark. You need the lantern for almost every room in here. Well, I say need. Um, you don't technically need the lantern to get through these areas, uh, as long as you know where you're going, but it's extremely difficult. And we already have the lantern from getting into Crystal Peak anyway, so it doesn't hurt us to have.
I also have to be a little bit careful here. These spiders that are crawling around the ground are on uh, random cycles. So I don't ever really know where they're going to be at any given point. So those toll gates in this room and the one that I used to get into Crystal Peak are basically the main way they gate off um, making you have the lantern for these two areas. Um, anything that you need to interact with is uninteractable if you don't have the lantern. If it's just the, the thing you're interacting with is just shrouded in darkness, you can't use it. So they put those two gates there to force you to get the lantern, which is really annoying. Uh, and any percent you can just go out of bounds around the room here that um, requires it. Which is really nice. So this is the area where the final dreamer is. Uh, this area doesn't have a boss, uh, but it's still extremely annoying. Uh, there's enemies called devouts here, which you'll see in just a second. They basically just have invi uh, giant invisible, like, hard-coated walls on their face. Uh, and it results in you just having to kill them in order to get past. And they have a relatively large amount of HP compared to the damage that we do at this point. We're kind of at the point now where the damage that we do falls off extremely bad. Back up there, buddy. So what these guys decide to do is pretty random. They can back up or open their face and try to hit you. And there's really no rhyme or reason to them doing either. So you kind of just have to be ready to react. Oops. Okay, I saved that. We're good. They also do two damage to you if they hit you, which is extremely scary since we only have... Five maximum HP. Oh yeah, that's a grub. Those are a collectible. They're pretty cute. Okay, so we have one more devout to get past here. We're a little bit short on Geo, so I'm going to have to pick up some backup Geo. Like I said, this money route is extremely tight. Um, in most circumstances, we just barely have enough money for what we need. I need 250 leaving this area, and that's the last uh, money that I need for the game. So this is the third Dreamer dead. Uh, now that he's gone, we can just head on to the final boss, and that's all we have left. So this game does have another ending, uh, which everyone just refers to as the true Shit. ending. Um, which has a completely different final boss. Well, it's attached to the existing final boss. It isn't just replacing the final boss. Um, but that is a separate category that people do run, and it's a really, really cool speedrun. Um, if you want to see a speedrun of this game that does just more of the content in general, um, check out a true ending run, both glitched and glitchless. They're both really, really neat, and some of the best things this game has to offer speedrun-wise, in my opinion. Definitely enough. And one thing I'll mention now as well is there's really no good visual indicator for the final split in this game. Uh, pretty early on, um, a fellow in the community by the name of Devil Squirrel um, made a auto splitter and load remover for us. And it basically goes off of when the game detects you beating the game as far as like the achievement unlocking. So that's when we end the time, and it's kind of just during a black screen. So I'll take a look at my splits and uh, give you time accordingly when they stop. I have them hidden right now just because I didn't want to know how well I was doing. This probably will not be a PB just because of that one death in Crystal Peak, unfortunately. My PB in this game is rather old. As I said, I took a decent break that I only just recently ca uh, came back from. So my PB does not reflect a lot of the improvements that we found recently. So uh, my PB right now is about a 47 minute time uh, loadless. Uh, the current record right now is about a 43 by a dude named Fireborn who... I don't remember how long ago it was now, but kind of just came out of nowhere. Uh, and has done amazing work as far as pushing this game down. 
Uh, for a good couple months after the game came out, I was largely, I'm not going to say I was the only person, but I was mostly the only person pushing the time down for glitchless and, you know, messing with the route and stuff. Uh, there was a couple other people that were helping me out, but not a whole lot of people were doing runs. Um, but Fireborn pushing the time down has really done a lot for this game as far as activity. And I'm going to go ahead and shut up for this boss as well, because I need to focus. Nice start. Okay, phase two. Nice dash right into him. Solid. Here, just to be safe. I'm playing kind of crappy. I don't know how he didn't parry that. <laughs> I love that. If you're above him when he does that scream, he just kind of hits you. He also only takes one damage while he's stabbing himself there, so you really can't do much else except fill up soul and heal if you need to. God, you are just being a friend today. That went decently. I had to play a little bit safe, but if you play properly aggressively and he actually cooperates, that fight can go extremely fast. That was still pretty alright. Alright, so let me... Uh, time. Like I said, kind of just randomly during a black screen. It's not the most definitive end split time. Nice, my dude. Yeah, that's Hollow Knight. That was actually a pretty good run apart from that really silly death in Crystal Peak, but it happens. Umu is also a jerk, but that also happens. But yeah, I'll also be doing this run at SGDQ, so... And on the 4th of July, no less, so... If you want to see me hopefully do better, be sure to check that out as well. America, fuck yeah, dude. Heck yeah. Alright, so... Anything you want to say to the boys before we... Peace no, out. I think that's it. Thanks for watching, guys. So we got a coming up. Shentok's going to be subbing in for us. Helping out. He's going to be playing some $350 Japanese-American game called Burning Rangers. It'll be dope. See you guys.